on this really quickly. And just want to say thanks, everyone, for, for joining the conversation today. Um, Wahab, I'll kick it to you to lead, lead things off in the conversation. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Parker. Uh, really excited for this and excited to uh, partner with the, with the scholars team for this event and our panelists that Parker will um, introduce or have introduced themselves shortly. But before we do that, uh, definitely want to welcome everyone to this and then also share a little bit about uh, URX. Hey, so I know that a lot of people are familiar with um, URX and all the things that we do, but for those of you that are uh, new to, to this or attending your first event with us, um, just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, URX is a one rec community for recruiting professionals focused on university, emerging, and early career talent. Um, I like to also add that the thing that sort of I think uh, ties us all together is that we're all super passionate about the space. Um, you'll find that a lot of the folks in our community are, are diehards or lifers, as I like to, to call them. And we have a few of those on, on the panel today as well. So maybe they can share a bit more about that. Um, if you're not a member um, of the community, uh, we'd love to have you join us. Um, you can do so at the link that's on the screen here. I'd also encourage you to give us a follow on LinkedIn, um, whether it's the one rec page or the URX page, it's the best way to kind of stay in touch with everything that we're doing. Um, so really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to have you all here. And um, once again, we a lot of the things that we do for the community, um, we're very much volunteer led are because of the amazing sponsors that we have. Um, and Scholars is a, is a company and a community of, of themselves that has become one of our newer sponsors. And I'm really excited um, to be able to work with them and to provide um, this great content for you. So with that, over to you, Parker. Thanks so much, Wahab, and, and we appreciate your all's partnership in, in working on this and helping us get, put this together. I know this topic is super top of mind for hopefully everyone that's joining the call today and our amazing panelists are going to help us really kind of shed light on what it means to design that effective key form strategy. Um, before we jump in, just briefly uh, as well, just want to make sure that I call out Scholars, our company, Parker, one of the co-founders here, and going to be moderating the conversation today. Scholars. Really, we're an early career candidate engagement and communication platform that really for us, our, our goal is to help early talent kind of foster community, form relationships before their first day on the job. Um, at the end of the day, for us, that time between offer acceptance start date is the most crucial part of the recruiting process that we see fit. And so our goal is to really help early talent go from offer accept the start date and really be excited and bought in about the opportunity. So without obviously learning about URX and scholars, we've teamed up and I'm super excited for our conversation today with our amazing panelists who are going to be giving us an introduction shortly, but I wanna make sure that I frame the conversation today just to get everyone kind of in the frame of mind of how we're gonna be talking about designing an effective key form strategy. Obviously it's no surprise to all of you or most of you TA experts about the value of a, a personal and nurtured relationship with a candidate throughout the entire recruitment process. And we're finding ourselves in early talent where offers are getting uh, extended and accepted earlier and earlier in that process creating these eight, nine, even 24 month lead time between when a candidate has accepted their offer and before they start. And man, does that put a lot of stress on that relationship and white glove experience that we wanna provide to a candidate. Couple that with the data coming from Varus and ourselves um, about 63% of candidates saying that they would renege on an offer if another one came around man, that makes you think, right? So why is this happening? How can we make sure that we're getting ahead of a potential renege or turnover with an effective key form strategy to not only boost and continue recruiter morale, but also make sure that our candidate experience is truly delivering a, a wow factor in getting them to that point today. So with that, Everything today is going to be talking about what that key form strategy and designing it looks like with our amazing panelists. How do we ensure our post offer experience is top of line, uh, is top notch? Um, and how do we ensure that our key form strategy is bringing in the perspective of this generation of early talent, Gen Z, who we all know are a bit different than who we've recruited in the past? So 
with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are going to get into our conversation today. Uh, again, I want to thank Christy and Anne and Natalie for all coming and being a part of this conversation and sharing their expertise. So with that, uh, Anne, I'll kick it to you first. Could you just give an introduction of yourself, your role, and then your all's program at Eaton? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Parker. And thanks for having me. I'm excited to to be here with all of you today. Um, so I'm Ann Bailey. I work for Eaton Corporation. I'm based in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I've been with Eaton for a little over six years um, in various HR roles. And currently I'm on our early talent team um, in a senior program analyst role. Um, I've been on the team for just under a year. So still kind of new to this attracting young talent space. Um, so, so lots to learn, of, of course. Um, one of my main responsibilities is managing the intern experience, um, which is inclusive of that keep warm strat strategy that we're talking about today. Um, so did you want me to talk about the, our keep warm program or just our early talent programs in general? We'll just keep it introduction high level okay. and then make sure we dive in. So okay. but thank you. yeah, but thank you for that. And Natalie, yeah. I'll kick it to you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. And Parker, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Natalie Schwalk. I'm the senior program manager for early talent programs at MongoDB. For those of you who might not know MongoDB, we are a database platform company. We're headquartered in New York. That's where I'm coming to you live uh, from today. And I've been with MongoDB about three years. I just hit, I'm a little over three years, just hit my three year anniversary and started as a coordinator on the team, then grew into a campus recruiter role and more recently into more of the program manager strategy space when it comes to our early talent. And at MongoDB, we have two main um, areas where we focus for early career within the space of internship and new grad. So we have our summer internship program, which I manage kind of oversee the strategy of, as well as our new grad program, which is rotational in nature and expanding every single year and getting more departments involved. So it's been a lot of fun. It's been a great ride here at MongoDB um, and just excited to hear all the insights from this panel and connect and you know, happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn as well after this. Thanks, Natalie. Christy, to close us out with an inter intro. Awesome. Well, my name is Christy Eads. Um, I work at SAS Software and Analytics. I just celebrated my sixth year anniversary with the company and for the last five years have been on the early career team. Um, my role specifically is the early career recruitment outreach specialist. So um, I get to oversee building a pipeline of qualified and diverse talent for our hiring initiatives. My team is responsible for hiring over about 200 interns, 250 interns, um, and about 200 entry-level positions as well. So um, excited to chat about all things Keep Warm today. Yes, and all of your perspectives are so appreciated in the time that you've taken. Um, I forgot to mention, and for everyone that is in the audience and listening, I want to make this as uh, conversational as, poss as possible. We'll be doing 30 to 40 minutes of a conversation and then hold Q&A until the end Please feel free if there's questions that pop up while we're talking about all things designing an effective keep warm strategy, drop them in the chat. I'll make sure that I'm monitoring the chat ongoing, and then we'll make sure that we address all those questions at the end of our conversation um, today. And thank you all. Um, so with that and in intros out of the way, designing an effective keep warm strategy, it's something that's top of mind for probably everyone that's joining this conversation and a lot of companies, especially in the time that we're in right now, fall season's kind of winding down, interviews, offers might even start being going out and accepted and they graduate or they stop school in June and how are we engaging them? So I think a good place to start would be, um, how do you all define a key form strategy? I can start. Cool. Um, yeah, so at Eaton, um, I think it's it's been a bit of an evolution over the last few years. Um, but I think in our, our current state, we're really defining it as um, the time between a candidate accepting an offer 
when that kind of formal communication stops from us to when the formal communication picks up again and onboarding starts. So kind of that downtime in between all of the constant communication from, from our company and how we're, we're keeping those candidates engaged during that time. And I, I guess, Christy, as you think about it as well, I know in our earlier conversations, you all have kind of two frames of mind for a key form strategy. I would love for you to talk about that. Yeah, so definitely, like Anne said, that that crucial period of time after a, a student accepts an offer and has that waiting period to join the company, that's always been um, a major focus of keeping keeping warm. But as we've seen, and as Gen Z has certainly changed the game over time, um, it's no longer just about candidates who have already accepted an offer because they're they're kind of still candidates, right? Students have more options than ever. Um, so they're really important, yes, but then also there's this other bucket of people that we consider, you know, in our keep warm strategy, um, and that's candidates who are actively in play. So who have already applied to our process, but maybe haven't received an offer yet. Um, you know, as, as much as we would love to have a perfect recruitment process, there are definitely downtimes from the time that they apply to maybe the time that they're interviewing or receiving an offer. So there's also a component to our strategy of, you know, keeping that, that pool of candidates warm that are waiting to hear back from us about certain things. So um, we found that engagement with that population has led to better acceptance rates down the line when they've engaged with our brand more, when they know more about us, when they feel like they have a better understanding, um, that certainly leads to better outcomes. Awesome, and I would, as you think about that type of key form strategy for those candidates who haven't accepted an offer, maybe they've applied, any specific type of information that you all are sharing, types of content, things that you found that work for that type of candidate? Yeah, so we actually just had a really successful event um, last week where we, we called it Meet the Recruiter, and we invited students who had applied to a specific program to come, and we accepted questions in advance so that we could kind of answer those, those FAQs. Um, but really kind of framed it up as like a, a peek behind the curtain. So just transparently, authentically shared like what's going on behind the scenes. Um, even if that means, you know, us saying like, hey, we know this isn't perfect, but we're juggling multiple calendars behind the scenes. We're managing all of these candidates and more. And we promise we're, we're doing our best to get back to you. And um, my team has put a really big focus on humanizing our process. And so I feel like by allowing students to have that opportunity to meet with us, it was able to kind of meet them where they are, give them an opportunity to, to learn and ask their, their questions that they have. Um, but we're all really busy, right? So like we can't offer a one-on-one -on -one session with every single applicant. So this was a way for us to kind of do that at scale, but still yeah. give them that nice human touch. I think that humanization is something that is, as you mentioned, tough to achieve at scale. And it's what can we do as a part of our key form strategy to bring that human component as much as possible in reason, while also making sure that we're not drowning our time um, in 200 interns and those one-on-ones as well. I mean, Natalie, as you think about MongoDB and, and your all and how you think about and strategize your key form strategy, would you have anything to add? Yeah, so I think one, one I guess, thing I wanted to talk about was one of our company values is think big, go far. And so we, our program has grown over the last 10, 11 years immensely. And even our early talent team almost doubled in the last year. So what's great about that is we've had a lot of new ideas um, bring, you know, coming to the table with new leaders and new team members. And so um, we're kind of piloting a bunch of different things right now, um, even for the first time. And one initiative we're doing is a newsletter that goes out to everyone who has accepted or are pending um, from last summer's internship class. And so in that, we decide to include a list of, here's all the people that have accepted. And that kind of creates an excitement, right? Um, we also include company events that are happening. We had an event hosted for International Coming Out Day. So we shared some of those photos and um, we also included sort of uh, pictures and quotes of why new grads accepted their offer. So trying to make it a little bit more personal than just, oh, here's 
you know, what's here's the numbers of how many people accepted, trying to really personalize it. Another thing that we decide to do uh, is this event with our CEO, um, as well as with our ERGs, our employee resource groups. And so that is an hour long session only for those who've accepted, because sometimes there is company specific information. Um, and that's a time for Q&A directly with Dave, our CEO, which the candidates have been loving, um, as well as our employee resource group. So they get a chance to see, it's both for new grads who are coming back um, full time as well as interns. And then we're gonna do some breakout groups within that session. So maybe incoming interns can ask new grads, wow, what was your experience like? Um, and really creating those connections, I think will be important. The other thing we're doing for the first time is an ambassador program. And this was something that a new team member who joined a couple months ago is piloting. And we're gonna have swag and a lot of fun prizes going along with that. And so I think for our team, it's really about trying new things, seeing what sticks, and then just retrospectively looking back and looking at the data, looking at the engagement, seeing if it worked, and then you know iterating on that going forward. So I would say it's a very exciting time for our team in terms yeah. of uh, our Keep Warm strategy. And a little bit later on in the conversation, I know we're going to be talking about tracking your Keep Warm strategy. Um, so I think I'm sure we have a mixed bag of people that are have joined the conversation that might have a super robust key form strategy, others that might not have anything in place. And so as you all think about strategically how your key form strategy is executed, could you talk a bit about, and I guess, Christy, I'll kick it to you, when that process starts from the strategy standpoint and kind of like what goes into those conversations Honestly, even who owns <laughs> who owns that key form strategy process, which is the age old question I think a lot of people might be having as well. Yeah, I love that, and it's I feel like it is a you know recruitment retention conversation, right? And um, for us, what what we typically do is use those those down summer months. <laughs> so when you know the students are actively already with us and they're going through the intern program, um, take a look and. For me, I, I kind of stage it month by month. So I like to look at, okay, you know, in September, we probably have some offers out, maybe, you know, our, our returning interns or conversions or, or, you know, what have you. But for the most part, we're like active recruitment. So if they're hearing from us, it's, you know, pretty regular because they're actively recruiting. Um, by the end of October, we generally have some offer acceptances. And so what I start to do is, is put together a month by month plan of like, what and when we want to contact students. Um, for me, that has looked different, right? Every month might be different from, you know, this month we're going to send an email with a picture of my team and our Halloween costumes. So um, it can be as basic and free as, as an email, just wishing everyone a, you know, a happy holiday for whatever the holiday is. Um, but that also serves another purpose because we want to show them again that we're, we're humans behind the scenes. So we're like, this is the early career team. This is who's hard at work behind the scenes. Um, but that also, you know, we're fun. We were various news anchors for Halloween this year in our little Zoom bubbles. So that was nice. Um, and then when we think about, you know, getting closer to the end of their semester, we generally send a keep warm care package um, around exam time. So we take a, a peek at, you know, our, our main target universities and when those final exams fall and try to send something around that time. Um, so I do generally request, you know, a small budget to do something. Um, and we'll send, you know, a little postcard or um, we've sent gum in the past with like a little, I love a good pun. I can't, I can't get past them. So we'll include a little pun, like, you know, if we send them orbit gum, it's you're out of this world and you're going to crush it on your, you know, exams this fall. No. So I try to vary it up between you know, which, which medium they're receiving information from us from. So I spend the summertime doing that and just really going month by month from September through until May, June, when they're actually going to start with us and just kind of decide what, what the best kind of communication looks like at that point in time. Who are the owners of kind of that execution, Christy, at, at SAS? Uh, you know, for a while, it's been, it's been me. Um, so I'm not formally a recruiter on my team. So um, after I'm really done with like the bulk of event execution, I, I really start to focus in on supporting the recruiters as they're going through this really busy time. So um, for me, uh, for my team, it's me with usually help from some yeah. people. We like to make it a game. And if we can, if we're sending something physical in the mail, we'll get together in a conference room. 
put on a good playlist and knock out, you know, stuff in packages. Um, and that's usually a fun time. So I, I usually take the lead on the initiative, but teammates are supportive. So. And Natalie, anything to add about kind of when you all strategize your key form strategy or kind of who's involved in that process as well? Yeah, sort of a similar timeline. Um, we did have our early ID summits this past May. And so those are um, for specific underrepresented groups within technology, those who self-identify. It's a specific summit where they can get to know MongoDB, meet our um, leaders and, and just understand what life could be like here at MongoDB, what sort of things they could have impact on. Um, and we actually put them through the interview process a little bit earlier, um, keyword early ID, to uh, have them join for next summer. And so we did begin with that population a little bit sooner. So because there's a huge gap from accepting an intern offer for the following summer, we decided to invite them to our open house. So that's open to every candidate from, um, even if you're not eligible for the internship for this summer upcoming, say you're a freshman, we still encourage everyone to attend. And so we had them attend that. We'll have them attend our um, event with the CEO that's happening. And we'll start to include them in comms a little bit sooner than maybe the general population. But I would say like Christy mentioned, usually around end of September, maybe October, we just sent our first uh, newsletter that I mentioned of here's all the accepts that we have. And then usually about once a month is a good time frame. Um, any more than that, it might just appear spammy to them and um, you don't want to just overwhelm them with too much information. So we found that to be really effective. And then once um, onboarding picks up, then obviously there's more action items included and maybe reminders that are included in those emails. But for now, we're just trying to keep it light, trying to keep it fun. Um, and I would say with the creation of the program manager role that I started this past February, that's really fallen under my scope. But obviously one person can't do it alone. So I uh, partner really closely with our recruiters as well as some of the coordinators specific to our team to execute that um, strategy, I guess, overall. So um, as far as the timeline sounds pretty similar. And I think as far as divvying up the work, it's it's something you know, you'll know you need your team support on too. Yeah, I would, I would echo what both Christy and Natalie said. And Christy, I'm taking lots of notes on what you're saying. <laughs> um, I love the idea of not um, kind of bombarding them with all things your organization, but seeing where they are as far as like in the middle of midterms or, or what have you. I think that's, that's a really, a really good concept there. Um, but yeah, very similar timeline. And then as far as who owns it, um, it's really myself um, and our program managers who manage our various development programs um, kind of pair together to figure out what the content should be. Um, but the execution is, is me. As you think about the candidates and their personas of who are going through your all's key form strategies, does the content and strategy differ for interns versus new grads? Or I guess, Anne, I'll start with you. How do you think about segmenting your key form strategy, if, if at all, um, and then a bit about the reasoning behind it? Yeah, and that's a good question. And I've, I've thought about it quite a bit. And I at this point, there isn't a ton of difference. Um, I think we're trying to, you know, the goal is to keep them engaged and to keep them excited about starting with us. Um, so at this point, really, the, the only differences are maybe when we're, when we're sending things, um, maybe how, how high touch we're being with them, depending on, um, you know, the, if they're going to be full-time or intern, but for the most part at this point, again, we are, um, you know, just kind of getting into the, the keep warm strategy, um, it, they're, they're pretty similar for full-time and intern. Um, but I really do like the ideas that, that Christy mentioned about the candidates who haven't received an offer yet and how to approach those, how to approach that population. So I think that's something we definitely um, are gonna be looking more into. Natalie or Christy, do you all approach that similarly or, or do you have segmentation as it relates to kind of your candidates? 
So I would say because we have the rotational program, there are some slight differences that go into those emails just because we have to have certain forms that they need to fill out or certain action items to get that program set up. So right now they are um, up until maybe onboarding, it stays pretty similar. And then once onboarding, I still consider onboarding as key form, I guess. Uh, once the onboarding emails come in and the reminder emails and we're preparing for like maybe the three months prior to when they start, those start to, to differ off and you kind of see the fork there. The only thing we do, um, slightly different, which for any, if there's any inter incoming interns listening, sorry about this, but we don't have a swag package that gets sent in particular to incoming interns, but we do send a special swag item to our incoming new grads just because, you know, it's, it's an exciting thing to start a full-time job. And then once the interns are actually here, they get their swag. Um, that's special, but that's the only, I would say, big difference that we have. And then once you know, some specific onboarding things come up, we differentiate that. Yeah, we, we try to keep it pretty consistent. Um, if for no other reason other than, you know, ease of, of sending those out, you know, on that, that monthly cadence. Um, and I also sometimes have a hard time of like, for our early career hires, you know, they're, they have that long gap maybe between they've accepted their offer before they start. But also I'm like, well, if our full-time employees and like other, you know, people aren't getting all this fun stuff, then I don't want them to, you know, just because of the recruiter who hired them feel left out. So we do try to keep it pretty similar in terms of like what they receive um, for interns and new grads, but not, not too crazy difference. I think something that we've heard as scholars from some partners is on the community aspect of their key form strategy, trying to get their cohorts connected before their first day breaking up those communities, maybe by location, by people who are having to relocate so that they can help try to facilitate a roommate, um, creating cool little like private communities for like pets, like hobbies and interests, like a sports community, things like that. So like the tactical like content and information they're sharing stays pretty consistent. And then where they see that segmentation work and just as an idea is like, providing those fun spaces for communities and like people that might have similar hobbies or interests or are just going to be in a similar position, whether they're working remote, hybrid, et cetera. So that would be the only thing I would add to that that we've seen um, as just an idea for people that are listening as well. So we have this key form strategy. We've designed it. We're going and we've executed it. Now our internship has started and we want to look back and understand did that actually work for us? I guess, Christy, how do you look at your key form strategy to understand the effectiveness of it and any sort of data that you look at or track? That is an opportunity for me right now, for sure. Um, I think what I try to do during is include our, you know, employer branding hashtag um, and encourage students to post on social as they receive different things. So for example, you know, when they accept an offer, they get a social media tile saying they accept it and we're like, tag us in that, you know? And yeah. um, I feel like that kind of social media generation is kind of how we, we see it in real life that they're receiving it, they're excited about it. Mm -hmm. I think that also kind of helps with them already starting the loyalty, right? If they're yeah. posting externally that they're gonna join the company. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely an area of opportunity for me to consider of like what, what do, does success look like and how can I better measure it? Um, so Natalie, Ann, if you all have better ideas, I'm all ears. I would agree that it's definitely an area of opportunity. It's hard to track that. I think really the only like concrete data at this point is the amount of reneges you get from that season. Um, and then you know, following up with a survey to capture the why behind the reneg. Um, but beyond that, yeah, it's definitely a tricky piece of, of the process. Yeah, right now we use to send, um, I guess, just the email portion, uh, email comms, we use GEM. We are able to see some data points as far as open rate and click through rate and which things that they're clicking. Um, so it's kind of helpful if someone's not completing their paperwork, we know 
exactly who it is. We can see if they open the email. Um, but I think a tool like Scholars is a huge opportunity, right? When, um, for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with it, just being able to track that data for the key form, you know, we have all these tools to track data of the recruitment process um, and pass through rates and, and success of that, but there really isn't an exact, you know, key form strategy for candidates once they've accepted. So, um, you know, right now, I think it's using GEM, using the tools that we do have, but, you know, thinking big and, and thinking, you know, down the line, what other tools can we implement so that we can keep track of those things? Um, I think it's important to look at the Reneg reasons as well. Um, and the other two quick things I wanted to comment on outside of, I guess, having a specific event or having an email comms go out, two other things that we do is we have the mentors reach out. Um, so whether that's their mentor or maybe a lead, reach out to them and set up a coffee chat, just checking in on them. We also have a buddy program through our ERGs, and we found that to be really helpful and maybe closing a candidate or just keeping in touch with them. And that's also something you can pass on. And I know we have all have lean teams and you can kind of punt that to the business, which can be really helpful and really impactful and meaningful uh, beyond just the early talent team. I agree. And I appreciate the shout out, Natalie, as well, obviously. Um, I think that uh, having and designing an effective key form strategy can be a challenge and even a challenge from a priority standpoint obviously there's a lot of things going on for teams um i guess natalie i'll, I'll kick it to you kind of how do you think about how can you champion like the importance of a key form strategy to a leader or, or someone that's like we need to put time and resources into this how do you think about that yeah, I think it goes back to the discussion about Renegs, right? And I know we're in this uncertain time right now. So I'm very curious to see each season since I've been at MongoDB, there's been a different narrative, a different story, a different thing happening. So right now it's about, okay, will candidates be more likely to accept an offer at a more stable company or something that appears stable in these economic times? But then again, had you know, everyone has a unique perspective of that. So I think it's about, you know showing you have to connect it back to the data right so any data that you can you know display to the leaders to show okay we did say for example this ambassador program we piloted it and out of the 20 ambassadors that we had 18 of them didn't renege right and they're they're coming and they're joining on could that have influenced their decision? You know, there's many things going through Gen Z's mind. We don't know, but it does tell us that there's there's something there to dig a little bit deeper. So I think it's about getting the data to that leader and, and making sure that they're hearing you. And um, it's also about getting the trust from the leaders too, right? Especially in these times uh, in terms of budget cuts and uh, you know how many intern numbers you're going to have, you really have to have investment from the leadership and um, have them invested in your programs in order in the first place, right? To even have an internship program um, in a slower time. And so I think it's about having the data to back it is the biggest thing. And that would all be unique to, I guess, what you're doing, whether it's an email campaign and you can show them the engagement there, or whether it's, you know, another type of event, attendance at an event, something yeah. like that. Um, I don't know if the other panelists have have any other thoughts. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree, Natalie, the, the key is that getting that leadership trust and, um, you know, we're, we're a data analytics company, so we love the data. Um, and we use various insights to kind of look at, you know, what are what's what trends are happening with students. Um, and there is some really clear cut data from them that says how students want to be kept in touch with and what has led them to consider other offers or, you know, what what makes them feel tied to a company. So um, for us, we've, we've certainly gotten that buy in um, from leaders seeing both the data, but then also seeing the results of the program. You know, when we when we have the resources to hire top talent, um, you know, the, the business is happy when they get great hires, too. So. Definitely. And I think the only other perspective I'd bring in that, that we've heard from companies is thinking about how their key form strategy post conversion can tie back to a reduction of cost per hire, because if they can convert, obviously someone as an intern, 
for a lot of companies, it's cheaper than going external to go and hire a new grad. Um, and so I would just call out that that would be one data point. I think that we've heard companies from a success standpoint, go to leadership and say, here's why we need to invest in this robust experience in this interim time period, because it goes back to ultimately cost per hire, which is what we're here to do is fuel the company with early and diverse talent. Um, so, and there are a ton of questions rolling in. So I'm super excited uh, to make sure that we get to, to those. Um, I guess any of you, just any three of you to close us out, just like if someone isn't investing in their key form strategy or they're like pulling their hair out and kind of, where do I start? Where do I start? Would you have one piece of advice to tell them? I do. Keep it simple. You know, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. If anything, I think students just want to hear from hear from the company. So even if it's as simple as, you know, a welcome email or, you know, encouraging the managers or a buddy to reach out. Um, I think those small gestures can make a big difference. You know, if you don't have a proof for budget, if you are like a one man show, um, you know, you can you can do things at scale. Um, that don't have to be really fancy in nature, but will still make the students feel those warm fuzzies, as I like to say, um, and keep them excited about your company. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Christy um, as far as keeping it simple. And also from like the budgeting perspective, I know that's an issue for a lot of places, um, being able to repurpose things. So um, for example, for our keep warm strategy, you know, we have a number of podcasts that we've done with Parker um, <laughs> that we've been able to re reuse now for our keep warm and, and sending those out to these candidates who have accepted offers. Um, you know, hey, listen to our VP of learning and culture talk about, you know, whatever the subject might be. Um, and using things like our IERGs that are on our external websites, sending out links to um, Eaton in the news for sustainability or, um, you know, top places to work in the country, things like that, like find creative ways to repurpose what's already out there, but just make it targeted towards that population. I love those. So start simple, repurpose content, but also say, Get involved um, in the community. I mean, in URX, I have been part of this community for the last three years, and I truly can say I've learned so much from everyone at all levels of, of different um, companies, different industries, and just educate yourself and take the time to maybe attend events like this so you can learn a little bit more. Set up your own events. <laughs> uh, we've had a couple of those ad hoc events where we just started a conversation in the URX Slack channel and it turned into a meeting that was really fruitful. So I think, you know, don't be afraid to just reach out to someone, even any one of us, right? To do a coffee chat, learn a little bit more, dig a little bit deeper. And the final thing I will say is not everything's going to be a success, especially when you first start out. So don't be discouraged. For example, we did a LinkedIn um, group last year, total failure. <laughs> the only people commenting were, you know, our team and maybe one intern that was really passionate. Um, it's okay. Not everything's always going to work out, but unless you try, you'll never know. So, um, you know, be patient and, and kind to yourself too. Awesome. We have reached the point in the conversation for Q&A. And Natalie, it's to you. There's a few of them talking about and asking about your ambassador program. So would you be able to talk a bit more about what is your ambassador program, kind of who is selected to be an ambassador and kind of how you go about executing it? Definitely. So this was one of the new ideas that were sort of uh, dealing with right now and, and piloting. Um, and someone who recently joined our team had a really successful program at their previous company. So um, we're testing it out. We're starting small. So we decided to only focus on certain universities um, that we technically would either do an on-campus or virtual event uh, putting dollars behind it for successful uh, schools. So in our eyes, we have a couple of different data points that we look at as far as reneg rate, um, acceptance rate, and conversion to uh, accept our new grad role. So for those core schools, uh, for anyone who has 
accepted an offer, it's a point system. So it'll be on the recruiter who recruited um, or converted that um, intern to new grad or intern to return intern to reach out to them, let them know we have a fun flyer we've created in Canva um, to let them know what's in it for them, what are the um, parameters and what are the requirements. And then it's all based on points. So they'll accrue points if they provide, say, a referral resume, if the referral reaches a certain stage in the process, if they connect us to a professor, if they help us host an event, if they get us in with a student organization that's a diverse group. And so all of these points add together. And then to be economical, it's when they officially join full time is when they're going to be able to kind of put all their points together and select from some really cool swag prizes. Um, so we did it that way instead of, you know, <laughs> sending a lot of swag to maybe some um, students who end up reneging. So we did build that in as a, as a safety net, uh, but that's what we're doing. We're gonna try it out, see how it works. Um, and right now we have uh, a decent amount who have signed up for it. So stay tuned, we'll see how this goes uh, this fall. Awesome, thank you, Natalie. Natalie, how are you all kind of like executing it, like handling it? Yeah, so what's really nice about that is it's not all on one person. So each recruiter is going to be managing that relationship with the ambassador themselves. So for example, when they um, accept and say, yes, I want to do this, they're writing a handwritten note, like congrats on becoming an ambassador, sending them a t-shirt as like their first piece of swag. And yep. then they're communicating with them directly to check in every month to make sure, oh, you know, have you done this? Have you done that? giving them their points and totaling it up. Um, and then probably likely when they come back, the recruiter will take them to the swag closet and, and let them choose their swag. Awesome. Christy, there was a question asking about if you have a, a planning calendar that you use for your, when you strategize your key form strategy in the summer, your kind of month by month plan. Yeah, honestly, Carrie, I started with just an Excel document um, and it had, a, let's see, it's got time frame method. So like time frame is month, method is email or snail mail, touch point or themes, you know, to try to break it up and not just repetitive the same things. Um, and then the creation completion ideas. But I will say, um, I have seen some really great resources from various insights. They also provide some really great templates and emails and such. But Parker, I was poking around on the Scholar's website and saw some downloadable free templates there too. So um, plug for Scholar's, they have an Excel spreadsheet that's already built out that you can download from their website um, with some really great ideas. So if you're <laughs> in the market, there's, there's stuff out there. Thanks, Christy. Yes, those are all free resources on our website, hirescholars.com. Um, someone raised their hand, Jasmine. Um, Jasmine, did you have a question? No. Oh, accident. Okay, no worries. No worries. Um, awesome. And Kaylin asked about types of swag that you all provide and like how you determine what swag your candidates want. Um, I know we had a someone threw in a, a link in the chat. I don't know if any of you have anything to add on that or kind of how that is determined. Um, I can talk about that a little bit. So for Eaton, um, something that we've focused on is trying to give things that also relate to our company, right? So um, most recently, something that comes to mind is um, sustainable straws, right? So reusable straws. Um, we sent those out with, you know, an Eaton branded carrying case for them. So kind of cute. Um, and I have one myself. Um, so things like that, I think like the sustainable piece yeah. is important, especially with Gen Z too. And again, that's, that's data that we also have gotten from, from Veris. Um, and then of course the typical like t-shirts, um, bags, like various kinds of bags. Um, those are, those are kind of the main things that we've, we've had success with. I would echo that. And I think this, this generation, and for all the right reasons, cares a lot about sustainability. So it's no longer about who's got the best tchotchkes at their table. Um, you want to get your branding out there. And I think that's so important. But I have a really hard time going to career fairs and 
seeing students like get a bag and then just drop it in the trash of full of stuff. Um, I personally love a reusable bag though. So like Anne said, reusable bags are great. Um, the t-shirts I feel like resonate really well. And then I, I try to keep it sim simple, pens and stickers and stuff um, for those freebie giveaways. Um, and then I, I also try to correlate like, you know, how much we're gonna invest versus what that, you know, to who. So like at a career fair, we're not gonna spend a ton of money and give them the nice reusable water bottles for students that may or may not ever consider us. Um, but for our interns, yeah, we'll, we'll get them a nice mug. We'll get them a water bottle. Like we'll, we'll spend a little bit more there. Um, this year, I, I definitely ebbed away from too many tchotchkes at my table, but we have a great employer brand, a story about how we have M&Ms in all of our break rooms. And so instead of putting a ton of swag out on our career fair table, I put M&Ms out with a little poster board talking about that. So, um, the candy attracted people. And then it also served the purpose of telling our employer brand story. So. I love that. That's awesome. Any more questions from anyone in the audience for our panelists about anything that we've talked about today, maybe something we haven't talked about that you wish was covered. Um, give it like 30 seconds just to see if we get any more questions from anyone. This has been so awesome. I really appreciate and Christy, Natalie, the time that you all took today. Um, and I'm sure our attendees are appreciative as well. Um, so I guess with that, if there's no, oh, yes, another question. With ambassador programs, other than like a point system to get swag, do you pay them? Great question. So as of now, we don't pay them. Um, I think we have to pilot it out and see if it is worthwhile before putting some of the budget behind it. Um, I know a lot of companies who have a really built out program will pay them. And I think that's incredible. That's amazing. Long term, that would be my goal. I think that would be awesome. Uh, but as of now, we're we're not paying them. Kayla shouting out Christy. Obviously, thank you, Kayla, for joining as well. Um, well, if there's no more questions, I just want to make sure I take the time to say a personal thank you to everyone that attended, as well as all of our panelists. Obviously, our team at Scholars is super passionate about all things post-offer experience, key form strategies, and, and engagement with early talent to truly make sure that those candidates that we put so much time and effort into recruiting show up on their first day. I'd be remiss if I didn't say if this was a good conversation, if you have additional questions, this is kind of what we do. So I would love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn, reach out to our team, and we're always here to help those resources on our website. We found to be super helpful. Go there, download them, please, as well. Um, and otherwise, just thank you to our panelists once again uh, for the conversation and for taking the time. And we hope that everyone that attended this was super helpful. It will be recorded. It is recorded. And we'll make sure that everyone that attended gets the recording afterwards as well. Um, so that you all have this for top of mind for hopefully your key form strategy conversations in this ever more pressing time period. So thank you again to everyone. Um, and I hope you all have a great Friday Eve, as we like to say at Scholars. Thanks, Thanks Christy thank and Natalie. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, y'all.